Welcome to the Healthy Podcast, where we invite you to invest in your well-being and unlock the secrets of vibrant health, peak performance, and wellness. Join us, Sebastian Mirau and Johannes Kettelhout, co-founders of Australia and New Zealand's leading wellness company, as we dive deep into the science, strategies, and stories that empower you to live your healthiest, happiest life. Whether you are a CEO, high achiever, entrepreneur, elite athlete, health enthusiast, scientist, or self-improvement seeker, together we will explore the cutting edge of biohacking techniques and holistic health practices with world-class experts that optimize your mind, body, and spirit. With each episode, you will walk away with practical and actionable steps to integrate in your daily life. Are you ready? Let's elevate your world. Being. I've always oh. been in so many different things and I've only recently worked out what is my discipline and it's ancient future medicine. Amazing. So, so ancient future medicine is medicine that's so easy a caveman can do it. It's so obvious and effective that every great tradition, every great medical tradition and every great physician prescribed it. It's so complicated that modern science can't fully understand it. And it's so easy, you can just do it yourself at home. And, and, and those therapies that uh, classify as ancient future medicine include hot and cold bathing, the use of herbs, the use of honey, the use of fermentation. And that's been my world. I, I've been in the, the hot spring world and, and hot and cold bathing, but I've also been in the herbal medicine world. And now I'm in the honey world and the fermentation world. And they're all coming together. So... Ancient future medicine is sort of my discipline now. And there was, I, I feel, when I hear just the title alone, it, it, it feels to me, and then when you describe that, most cultures have that in, in them, all mm -hmm. ancient cultures, it feels to me like there was, was a point in time where it just got forgotten or not considered particularly valuable and nothing that has a lot to do with the Newtonian thinking, like if you can't explain it. And, and some of these are so complex and, and full spectrum therapies that it just, it, you can't, reduce it to one benefit, to one thing that is happening. And, and I think that, that made it really hard for society in the 1900s to really quantify it. And therefore they just said, no, no. Well, I think more. that's part of the story, not fully being able to explain it. Okay. The other part is it's really hard to commercialize it in an industrial way. Yes. Because hot and cold bathing, anyone can do it. Honey, yeah. anyone can have a beehive. Anyone can make their own ferments at home. Anyone can pick some herbs and put it in there and ferment it. So it's really hard to make that into a big corporate industrial enterprise. Mm. And I think now that's that we're rediscovering how to do that and um, empowering people to do it themselves. And that's sort of my, my mission. How do we create a culture of wellness? And that culture is what we do, but it's also a living culture of how we work, but also the culture of bacteria and yeast and how we bring that into our life and, and hot and cold and how we bring that into our life. So this is, it's, it's a really interesting time right now where where we're rediscovering these ancient techniques through the lens of modern science, but it's also got this new commercial reality to it. So now you're seeing you know, ice bars are becoming profitable for people to make ice bars and hot springs are becoming profitable to offer hot and cold bathing. And Manuka honey has been discovered. There's the most medicinal form of honey on the planet and, mm. and with antibiotic resistance and skin care and wound care and, and health care and pet care. Honey is amazing. And, I have a company, we make probiotics and kombucha and, and juan, which is fermented tea and, and honey. We're discovering that balances blood sugar and a controlled inflammation and the gut microbiome is becoming a thing. So all of these ancient forms of medicine are having this new scientific overlay, but also a new, new commercial overlay as well. And that, that's a really interesting space. Yeah, beautiful. You, you mentioned also an apple cider vinegar. I'm always passionate about it because I found it so tangible. Like if you have an ailment or, you know, you have a cough or something like that, take a bit of that. It's so yeah. powerful. It turns it, turns it around really quickly. I've just done some recent, we, we did some re recent research. And I mean, most people know apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is amazing, but there's something that's even more potent than apple cider vinegar. And that's kombucha vinegar. Mm. And, that, and that's because apples have polyphenols and polyphenols are these plant chemicals that are good for us. They're the Chemicals that protect plants from pesticides and or from pests and from some damage and, and predators. And it's like a plant's immune system. So that, those polyphenols are good for us. They're the anti-aging chemical. And apples and grapes have really high polyphenols. But what has even more 
polyphenols and apples and grapes is green tea. So if you take green tea and you ferment it, and if you, ferment, if you ferment it with sugar, you get kombucha. If you ferment green tea with honey, you get jun, J-U-N, which is even more ancient than kombucha. <laughs> and what we, what we found, and we did some research on this, is that if, when you ferment green tea with, you know, with sugar and make kombucha, you've got two and a half times the polyphenols in the ferment than you have in the original green tea. Mm-hmm. So that, that bacteria and yeast processing makes new polyphenols. And this is really ancient medicine. In fact, the word medicine comes from the same origin as the word mead. Oh, wow. So, so the first medicines were actually fermented honey. Isn't it? And honey is this incredible substance where it's, it's the only immortal substance in nature. I mean, honey lasts thousands of years, multiple lifetimes. I don't know if you call that immortal or not, but that's, that's as good as any biological substance gets. <laughs> but, um, honey isn't just a, a food and really good for the brain because the brain needs glucose and you can imagine our pre-hominid ancestors. The first tools they ever used, we used to rape beehives because that gave them the brood. It gave them the fat and the protein from the larvae and the pupae and the brood. It also gave them a really high glucose source, which they needed for thinking. Oh. And I'd say the honey fueled the first consciousness. Way before tools were used to kill animals, they were used to actually get beehives. And, and it's sort of, if you think about it, if you're out in nature and you've got a stone, sharp stone object, would you go kill an animal and eat raw meat or would you go get delicious honey? <laughs> it sort of makes obvious. <laughs> and if you listen, if you listen to you know, Paul Stamets and Terence, Terence McKenna, chimps will actually go down into the savannah and pick mushrooms. And if you've got honey, any food you put in the honey gets preserved. So putting psychedelic mushrooms into honey would have preserved them and given glucose and entheogens and this sort of spiritual experience to expand human consciousness. And that's the Stone Day hypothesis. It says our primitive ancestors actually became conscious through the use of honey, but also through the use of um, magic mushrooms and psychedelics, which expanded our, scrambled the brain and, and expanded our um, vocabulary and it expanded our, our cooperation and all these things that, that was in early human origin. And then if you've got honey and you put herbs in it, it's a preserve, but if it gets wet, it, it doesn't go off. It turns into mead. It ferments yes. and that's a hole. And yes. then it's even more, more medicinal. <laughs> this bacteria and yeast process become, makes it even more medicinal. And so the mead was the first honey. And there's a, a whole lot of really ancient research on oxymals. And oxymal is acid honey. And it's when you mix vinegar with honey. And Hippocrates, you know, everyone knows he said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Mm. But the main thing he prescribed were oxymals. Because both honey and vinegar are medicine by themselves. And they're both food by themselves. Mm. And when you mix them together, they're actually synergistic. And that was just, there was some research last year where that was shown where they took manuka honey, which is the most antibacterial honey, and they mm. diluted it to the point where it, it didn't kill bacteria. It wasn't bactericidal because it was diluted. Then they took some vinegar and they diluted that so it wasn't bactericidal. Then they took the two dilutions that, well, so dilute that didn't do anything. They added them together and it did something. It was bactericidal again. So they showed there's a synergistic effect between vinegar and honey. And that was to do with the polyphenol. So and in this research they did, they looked at white, white vinegar, just pure acetic acid. Yes. Then they also looked at apple cider vinegar, grape vinegar, date vinegar, and pomegranate vinegar. Yes. And the ones with the more polyphenols had the, had the more um, synergistic effect with the honey. And we also know that Manuka honey Usually it's, it's measured in methyl glyoxal, MGO level. And the more the MGO level, the, the more potent, the more valuable, the more antibacterial it is. But the MGO level is just a, po- a proxy as well for polyphenol content. So Manuka honey has some of the highest polyphenols. And when you use high polyphenol Manuka honey, and you use that to ferment green tea, which also has really high polyphenols, you have this incredibly high polyphenol vinegar, which is a jun vinegar, that you can then add leaves, roots, flowers, fruits, and, and fungi to it. And you get this incredible form of medicine. That's what our ancient ancestors used to use. In, in ancient Persia, there were 1200 different recipes for oxymals. Wow. Space or medicine. And we've lost that. And that's because it's, it's hard to commercialize. Anyone can do that. It doesn't take much to get some natural honey and some green tea and some herbs and mix them together and ferment cementers and Suddenly you've got your own medicine and it's also hard to 
scale that for a big corporate mm. production. It's not like a pharmaceutical where you can, you know, make lots of it to the microgram and then sell it in capsules. Because mm -hmm. honey is work. It's, it's a, there's a proof of work in honey. You need flowers and you need mm. and you need to tend to them. And if you know, you've been a beekeeper, you know that it, it's not, doesn't happen instantly. There's quite a bit of work involved. And it's really hard to scale that up in massive production. And what, what currently most beekeeping in the, in the Western world is, it's industrial beekeeping, which is used for pollination. It's not about the honey. It's about the pollination yeah. to serve monoculture crops. Yes. And I think we have to um, revisit that because that's not sustainable. It's terrible for the bees. We've now had varroa mite um, take over the whole planet. Um, the bee populations around the, around the world are under threat from pesticides, from electromagnetic fields, from habitat destruction, from poor nutrition and migratory beekeeping. And we need mm. to rediscover a new model. And I'm working with a company now, Gather by Manuka, which plants a forest of flowers and keeps the bees in one place. And, and most of those flowers are Manuka to make the most valuable honey. Mm. But there are also other healthy flowers for bees because bees are the same as humans. They need a diverse diet. They need good pollen, not just good nectar. They need resin to make propolis. They need water sources. And they need a floral calendar that keeps them um, healthy all year round. And it just so happens that the, the highest quality Manuka honey in the planet comes from where you live, around Bunjalung area, around Byron Bay. Wow. And that, that, yeah, most people don't realize that. And, and that's because um, most people think it comes from New Zealand. And yes. that's because they did all the research in New Zealand. But New uh -huh. Zealand only has one species of Leptospermum. It's Leptospermum scoparium. Mm -hmm. In Australia, there's 87 species that grow naturally in Australia. Yes. But but only 15 of them have the DHA in the nectar that converts into the MGO in the honey. But even 15 species means the floral calendar is a lot greatly extended because in New Zealand it might be two to four, six weeks max that it yep. flowers. In Australia, it flowers for four to six months. You've got all these different species of different flowering times. And also the Australian species have more DHA in the nectar. They're more potent. So you get a higher level of, of MGO in the honey and, and also more polyphenols. So it's really interesting to see how honey has been researched. And now, you know, we're, we're selling 2,200 plus NGO honey, um, which is the highest in the world currently. And we might even get higher as our forests um, mature, but it, it makes it more, it makes it worthwhile for a, a local beekeeper now to keep the bees there and make them happy and just make honey. And that, that, that's commercially viable. And then you can quality add to that. So you can add mm -hmm. herbs, other things to it. So that's a whole nother branch of medicine. And, and of course, hot and cold therapy has been around since before humans were humans. You, know, you see chimpanzees and, well, not chimpanzees, you know, the, yeah, I keep <laughs> in the hot springs. You actually get chimpanzees using tools to get honey though. In fact, there's five, they're the most sophisticated tools in the animal kingdom are used to actually act as honey. And they've been observed to have see chimps use five different sorts of tools in a sequential order to actually act, break into the beehive, so they pound it, then they penetrate it and they use it, expand the hole, then they have dippers and scoopers to get the honey out. So that stimulates tool use. And again, human tool use came out of requirements and, and the, the value that's provided by honey. Love it. Absolutely love it. It's, it's, it's amazing to think about how, how much work actually goes into making honey from the bee because it's not just that they gather of course a lot to actually make that little teaspoon of, of, of honey but you know it's it's put into to a little cell and then it's really kept at the right humidity. yeah well you don't even put it into a cell a bee so a bee that bring, brings the nectar in mm. isn't the one that puts it in the cell if that's a forager bee they give it to a receiver bee that accepts it and then yeah. that receiver bee comes and works with another bee usually to put it in the cell but what they before they do they have to dehydrate it yeah, to do that, they blow nectar bubbles. So the bees actually blow a bubble of nectar and then the other bee fans it. So that, that, that helps mix their spit with the nectar. So it adds enzymes to the nectar yeah. and it also helps dehydrate it. So when they have to get it below 17% water to, to honey to be preserved, you know, almost pretty much forever. But it's also mixed with the, the enzyme from their saliva. Bees are literally blow nectar bubbles to dehydrate it and they put it in the cell, they have to fan it and then they cap it to, to make honey, which is incredible, incredible natural substance. So when we dive a little bit deeper into the active substance of polyphenols, yeah. wh what does it exactly do in the body and how can we sort of relate to it in 
the way that we at the moment treat diseases, illnesses, that type of thing? Like where, where does it sit and, and how could, could we sort of explain it from a, quite a, like a modern point of sure. view? So polyphenols in plants are considered secondary metabolites. So the, so the primary nutrients in plants, fat, protein, carbohydrate, you know, minerals, vitamins, are general essential. But the polyphenols are like the, the plant's immune system. They help defend the plants against predators. So often they taste bad or they, they taste bad for pre you know, predators. Yeah. They protect the plant from the sun. They protect the plant from oxidation. And they'll, in fact, there's, there's polyphenols that the plant produces to protect the bees. And, and you know, bees collect not just nectar and pollen. They also collect resin from plants. And that makes propolis. And the bees like spread the propolis around their whole beehive. That's full of polyphenols and, and these incredible beneficial chemicals. So in the humans, what, what polyphenols do, often they're anti-aging chemicals. So things like quercetin, uh, resveratrol, mm. um, flavonoids, the anthocyanins, the things that make um, blue berries and, and you know, plums and, and the blue chemicals that make plants really healthy, they're polyphenol. So the mm. flavonoids. These, these are polyphenols. So they, these are all the sort of the medicinal properties of plants are generally classed in that chemical class of polyphenol. And a, and a phenol is a phenolic compound, means it's got a ring structure. Mm -hmm. and a polyphenol means it's multiple ring, multiple ring structures in these chemicals. So that's, you know, it's a whole big class of, of phytonutrients, phytochemicals they're called. And depending on the plant, and each plant has its own unique signature of polyphenols and just like flowers need to attract a bee and to attract a bee to have a special shape and a color and a scent mm -hmm. and a aroma that makes you know, tells the bee you know when to come there's also these you know often they're due to the, the poly and, and often polyphenols have strong colors as well that's the other thing so mm -hmm. the colors in plants there's also carotenoids which are the red, red orange yellow colors and mm -hmm. polyphenols which are often the blue and other you know, darker colors in, in foods. And, and often the, it's the strong colored food that have these good health properties. Yes. So having so, a rate in your place is really good. Gotcha. So but when we think about someone who is a little bit below par, like a body that, that may be under stress, what do you say, what, what does it exactly do in the body? Is it like it, it, it acts like antioxidants, it, it, it fights, I don't know. Yeah, often, often they're antibacterial, they're oh. antioxidants, anti-inflammatory. Mm. Anti-diabetic, anti-cancer. Wow. So that's, that's the general class of, you know, polyphenol compounds. They're anti-aging chemicals. Yes. Um, so they, they prevent oxidation, they prevent wrinkles, they prevent, you know, fatty liver, you know, oxidation damage, inflammatory damage in the body. So probably all you really need to do is, so, so you know how there's a saying like the apple a day keeps the doctor away and I'm sure that, that. That is, that is powerful. But if I think about what you're saying, that that's taking it to a very different level and extracting or concentrating that power even more. And if, if you would have just a teaspoon or a tablespoon, I don't know, of, of, of this type of honey and maybe even infused with other things every day, that's probably a really good longevity strategy right there. Just, well, just, right? Well, absolutely it is. And, and apple, that, apples are high in polyphenol. That's one of the benefits of apples. So they're really high polyphenol, especially in the skin of the apple. Huh. Um, but we now know that, you know, red wine's really high in polyphenols, you know, in the skin of the grape, you know, resveratrol and that, those chemicals. But we know the green tea is probably one of the highest foods mm. for polyphenols. Mm. And what we're discovering is that when you process them, but not process them like in a factory, when you process them naturally, and the, and the most effective natural processing for food is fermentation. So you get bacteria and yeast. So it's a symbiotic arrangement between the yeast, which the yeast takes sugars and it breaks them down into alcohol. And then the bacteria takes the alcohol and turns them into organic acids. Mm. And in that process, it's like the, it's a two stage process. It's a yeast process and a bacterial process. But in that process, the yeast and the bacteria also make new polyphenols and new nutrients. So after having that fermentation process, you have a more nutritious substance than what you started with. So apples are good. Apple cider vinegar is better. Yeah. Because minted apples. You know, green tea is good. Kombucha is better. And, and green tea is good. Jun is better than even than kombucha because if you take honey, which has high polyphenols, and use that to ferment the green tea, you have this incredible explosion of, of phytochemicals from the honey and from the tea that also get processed by the bacteria in the yeast 
to have this incredible blend that then gives you those, those magnified benefits. And, and humans for 5,000 years, you know, since we had agriculture and mm. I've just been researching bees recently and honey, cause I find it so fascinating mm. that you know, the first bees were 140 million years ago. So that's you know, when dinosaurs were around and there weren't, there were no flowers then. And most bees were predatory. They used to eat other insects and they used to eat, you know, aphids and sap, you know, sucking insects, like, and they used to get the honeydew. But then bees started actually going straight to the plant to get the sugars. And the plants went into this sort of evolutionary competition to attract pollinators. Cause, cause before there were flowering plants, it was like, there was like mosses and ferns and, and conifers where they, they would rely on the wind to, to, to spread pollen and to spread the seeds. Well, plants realized animals could, could spread their pollen and also disperse their seeds. And they started competing to provide nectar and pollen to pollinators, bees and birds and things, but also to make fruit to attract animals and then spread the seeds. And it was only 17 million years ago when bees started to become social and live in trees. And that's when trees actually started, like flowering trees. And they did that for thermoregulation. And it'll, everything ends up coming back to me for, to thermoregulation. So the bees, to survive in cold weather, they, they realize if they, could, if they could harvest from a lot of different sources. So n- normally most bees in the world, and there's 25,000 sorts of bees, um, are species specific. And plants want bees to be species specific because they want to have pollen transferred from only to their kind. And there was sort of this tension and it's like a sexual tension because the plants wanted to have sex. They wanted their pollen to be spread. And, but the bees wanted to have, you know, the, the plants wanted fidelity. They wanted you to be you know, true to me. The bees mm. wanted to be poly- polymerous, you know, um, polyphorous, you know, had go to many flowers. And they sort of worked out that on any flight, a bee will, be, will have fide- fidelity to one sort of flower. Mm-hmm. That it only stays on one flower, won't go from different sorts of flowers. But the bee colony itself could be collecting n- nectar from multiple different flower sources all at the same time. The different bees, it sends out a squadron of bees for this flower, another squadron for that flower. No. But the bees only st- stay true to each flower. And that way the, the plants get pollinated. The bees have a much extended nutrition and a, and a bigger floral calendar. Mm. And in surviving, you know, the... Um, ice ages and, and, you know, cold weather in Europe, bees needed to store energy. And that's, that's where they started making honey as a colony. And honey, honey was actually designed as a, a biological battery to keep the colony warm over winter. You yeah, can, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, so just on that, like I, I, I beekeep in, in the south of, of New Zealand where you have, you have snow. So what happens in, in the, in the midst of winter or well, when, when winter starts, the, the stores are normally full. If you have a good beekeeper that looks after the bees properly and, and it is high in calories, of course, you know, like mm. honey has a lot of energy and, and they form a ball to preserve basically, you hey, know, the ball, that's it. You know, I actually measured for, for certain reasons also, well, what is the heat actually like? How do they, they normally gather around the, the queen, so mm. very layers of bees. Well, the queen and the brood, they want to keep the brood and the queen with that's, good nutrition and with warmth. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So, and, and, and what happens is that over time, if you, if you check them and, and just see how they're g- going, you know, at one stage, they might not even have root because it's not warm enough for that anymore. But, but certainly like you can see that it sort of shrinks like a battery becoming smaller and having less energy. And then eventually the first flower flowers again in the spring and, you know, all the nectar pours in and, and so on and all the protein bi- via pollen. And by the way, what I found amazing is if you get fresh pollen, and there is one particular dominant flowering tree of, of flower around. It's, it's such a delight to have fresh pollen because it, it has this true flavor of this particular plant, whatever it might be. So it's, to me, it's absolute magic. And yeah, well, it's, well, you know, pollen, it's interesting. So, and I've just, I've only learned this recently. Yeah. So pollen is, is amazing, but the bees don't eat pollen. They eat bee bread. So they take the pollen mm. and they ferment it. Mm. So they use this bacteria in the yeast process that I was talking about and, and pollen has about five or 10% available amino acids, but when you ferment it, you've got 85 to 90% available m- amino acids. Incredible. So that yeast, that yeast and that bacterial process of fermented pollen, it, yeah. it's called bee bread. And that's what the brood gets to, gets to eat. Mm-hmm. And it's much more nutritious than the pollen itself. Incredible. So good. So, so they basically 
just to, just to fo follow on your story so so basically they, they realized that they could create a battery by gathering as a colony and 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 gathering this this energy during during winter time to then get staying warm yes like a bee is technically ectothermic you know it's cold blooded and it changes with the temperature but a bee colony is like warm blooded it's endothermic it, it it keeps its body temperature constant all year round yes and that's amazing in the in the in the insect world to have a warm blooded animal but the animal is the super colony, the super organism of the bee hive itself, not individual bees. Individual bees are like the cells in your body. Bee hive is like the whole organism. And that's it's warm blooded. And that's all about thermoregulation. And that, that allowed bees and, and flowering plants to take over the world. Like 90% of the plants on the planet are angiosperms, are flowering plants, because of this relationship between pollinators and flowers and fruits. Yes, on this, this is crazy. So I understand that, you know, like a beehive does act as an organism. And, and so if, if a queen doesn't have really strong pheromones anymore to control actually and be smelled by all the odd bees in, in the colony, then at the edges of her kingdom, you, you find that those bees don't get these hormones anymore and they get a little bit this, you know, concerned about the strength of their queen. And, and what they do is they start to build different size cells. Queen cell, yeah that are becoming queens and, and, and therefore it triggers basically a, a revolt or potential revolt and, you know, and, and little queens will hedge or young queens will hedge and, and potentially, well, they normally let the queen know that they're coming, they actually knock and the queen can that's decide and knows. Like, they like kick the old queen out. That's it. Or, or fight. When I think about hypothermia in the body, the way that I understand it, and, and you might add your spin to it and, and give it more depth in terms of what really happens is that we, we, we create, we, we build certain saunas that are really hot. They're, they're, hot, they're sauna tunnels. You go in there with your long johns, people who have um, Lyme's disease or, or other virus infections, that type of thing, find it extremely beneficial to go in there, create such a high temperature that part of your body get into into a temperature where, where fever is indicated, if you know what I mean. So basically, like the infrared goes under the skin, it, it warms certain cells up, and the cells basically indicate I'm in a fever state, which is actually induced. Yeah. But at the moment where that happens, the whole body then gets the message and says, like, mm. something is inflamed. Somehow some of us have fever and have created fever, thinking it was actually the body itself rather than the heater. Mm -hmm. And then the whole body runs in... So hypothermia, and you can actually turn off the, the heat, the external heat at that point, because the body got the message of like, we have to act as one and really create this fuel, which is great because it creates more white blood cells is often used after uh, chemotherapy, that type of thing. And isn't it amazing that there's quite a relationship sort of like how these cells work, but also how the bees sort of work in, in the same way. Well, thermoregulation is required. All life has to exist within a, in a temperature range. That's why there's life on planet Earth, because we're in the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right for yeah. water to be in solid liquid and gas. And that's the Goldilocks zone. So yeah, yeah. Whether you're an amoeba or a human, you, know, you have to survive in, in a particular temperature zone yeah. and range. And your ability to survive in a temperature range will de determine how successful you are as an organism in, in you know, taking over the planet. And, and bees were super successful because they had this stored honey that could, they could survive, you know, eight, nine months of, of winter in, you know, really minus 25 degrees centigrade outside, but they'll keep warm in the inside a tree trunk and they'll eat up all their honey. I mean, they'll go through their honey yeah. reserves and then they'll, you know, stack on that honey again in summer so they can survive the next winter. But that, that stress of thermal stress, whether it's hot or cold, it turns on your adaptive adaptation so it becomes an adaptogen it, it helps you adapt to other stresses in your life so whether it's hot or cold you know yet you, you have heat shock proteins you have vascular changes you have cardio cardiovascular changes that yes. happen to help you adjust to those extremes of temperature and that is actually good for you because it, it helps you cope with disease or helps you cope with infection or other you know, metabolic or physical or chemical insults to the body so it actually makes you more resilient. Just, just to give it a really simple picture. So would you say that, let, let, let's say I'm, I'm really Im immobile and, and, and can't make many moves. You know, I can basically just walk. I'm someone who can just walk and not much more. 
that means really like I can't really interact with life and with my environment really well. You know, I can't bend over. Maybe I can't pick up my child and that type of thing. So are you basically saying that this thermal stress, stress is similar to actually you teach your body to be really flexible. You can move. If you roll your ankle, you actually don't get hurt because you actually know how to then fall. Is, is that sort of like, can I... Can I imagine my immune system and my body being similarly, if I stretch it into the cold and into the warm, warmth and, and all that it does to my cardiovascular system and so on and what you mentioned, does that mean actually if you throw a curveball, you, you have therefore way more ability to actually deal with it and therefore not being thrown over by it? It's exactly right. So it's, it's called hormetic stress. Ah. So it's stress that actually increases your ability to be resilient to future stress. Amazing. So in the adaptation to that stress, you're building up your repertoire. And, and the opposite happens. If you're, if you're just a couch potato and you're in a comfortable room and you don't do much and you're just watching TV and eating lots of food and there's no incentive for your body to deal with stress and you become like you're mentally and physically less resilient. So you're more likely to get sick. With, mm. Whereas when you exercise, exercise is stressful, you know, damaging muscle cells and you're pumping your heart and you're breathing hard, but that stress actually primes you and makes you more resilient for other stresses in your life. And one of the really interesting things I think is, is the psychological effects. Cause you know, no one really wants to get into an ice bath. You know, it, it's like it's not the first session of the day. The second yeah. one, you have to say, I get slightly you euphoric. Excited about it. Yeah. I totally agree. You don't want to. It's, you you have don't to really want to get in. But yeah. that practice of doing something you don't want to do because you yeah. know it's going to benefit you. And afterwards, you feel amazing. Afterwards, like you get resilient and wow, you know, you feel fired up. But that process of doing something you don't want to do then translates to the rest of your life. So when you, that difficult conversation, that email you didn't want to face, that job you didn't want to do, that really nasty, you know, job that, I don't know, you want to clean, whatever it is, we've mm. all got in our life we don't really want to do. But if you, if you practice having a nice bath, you know that I can just get on and do it and I'm going to be fine. And you've, you've practiced getting over that procrastination hurdle. So that, that then makes you more effective in, in the way you think and the way you behave and actually how you function in the world. Whereas if you're depressed, getting out of bed can be you know, a big drama and you know, making your bed, oh, forget about that. And you know, just, just house gets messy and you don't want, you know, because it's just all too much. So, so there's this. Our capacity increases and decreases with our ability to cope with stress. Mm. And one of the one of the best things we can do is find something that's very stressful that we like to do, but then we can practice being relaxed under stress. Yes. And this is why this is why I love saunering and, and ice bathing and hot and cold therapies because hot and cold they're existential threats. If you're too hot or too cold for too long, you die. But you can have that life-threatening stress a hundred percent under your control yes so you're in a sauna you know, you're you know if you stay people die in saunas i mean if you're drunk and you're forced you can die but if you're in a sauna and you're conscious you can consciously be under in control of that stress and when you're very stressed like you do in a yoga class you go to the edge of your limit of, of mm. stretching mm. and then you then when you get to the limit when your body says hey stop you're going to hurt yourself you then just stop and breathe and relax and you practice being relaxed under stress yes so the same thing happens in a sauna. You, you get really hot, you practice being relaxed under stress, and then you go to the opposite direction. You practice being cold and getting, and you know, it's stressful being in an ice bath. Mm. Practice relaxing while you're under the, the cold stress. And then one of the things that I, that I often talk about, we've probably talked about on the show before, is <laughs> I don't think enough other people talk about it, is the hot and cold is one thing, but probably the most important part is the relaxation at the end where you come back into balance and then you practice being relaxed while you're relaxed. Mm. And that's the equivalent of the relaxation at the end of the yoga class where, you know, you get all the benefits from the stretching or the, from the hot and cold. You get those benefits when you're in a really comfortable place and you just come back into balance and then you practice being relaxed while you're relaxed. Yes. So you go much deeper in relaxation than you would up. And, and they say that the, the greatest movement comes from the stillest point. So when you can find that still point where you've been to hot and you've been to cold and now you're in the middle and you can really totally relax and, and that's when you meet your true self. That's when your mind and body and your breath and your gut and all your organs are all on the same page, all actively doing nothing. <laughs> and 
if you can actively do nothing with your whole being, that means when you're doing something, you've got this strong center of action. That means you're acting with your whole self. It's not like part of you is doing this and the other part's not and the other part's, you know, and you're not a coherent being. You can actually bring your whole self to any task, which makes you more active. So it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic process and it changes because your capacity changes. As you do these things, your capacity to be, you know, the first time you do an ice bath, it takes two minutes, it feels like forever. The 10th time you say, oh, I want to go five or 10 minutes now, or enough. Because yeah, you build up your capacity. So it's really hard to give prescription. Like, you know, I'm still doing medical practice and people ask me, what, well, and often look, now how, do, how long should I spend in the ice bath? What temperature? And it's really hard to give a prescription because it depends on how you feel in that time. And it will change depending on how, how accustomed you are to doing this. So, so you need to actually use your sense of comfort yes. uh, as a measure of how, how long you need to spend. And I call it the, the point of forced mindfulness. When your body tells your body, it's like saying, I can't tell you how, how far you should do the split. Yeah. But I can tell you, go to the point where your body says, stop, it's going to hurt. Yeah. And, and then just stay at that place and breathe. And, and then if you keep on doing that, eventually your body will, will become more flexible and your, your, your hips will open up naturally. What's well, the same with hot and cold? You go to the point where it's, it's comfortably uncomfortable and then you just relax and stop there. This is incredible. We had a guest, Daniel Kirk, on the show a while ago and, and he, he was a professional football player and, and he looks now into... Uh, you know, does a lot of performance coaching and coaching in general. And we talked about the youth in particular, but in general that you need, you know, you do, you think, and you be. Hmm. And, and I was taught, we were talking about being bored and how that's uncomfortable for, for many, many young people in particular, but in general, you know, it's not something that people are comfortable with. And, and that is a state that is quite still. And that, that lets you actually go quite deep and, and create a center, you know, where, where, where you're at. And, and where you digest also certain things by just being really, really still. But it's the one that is the hardest to do and in our, our times today. People, they don't, they're scared of being bored and they'll just, they'll shit scroll. You know, they'll pick up a phone and just shit scroll yeah. rather than actually, actually do a meditation or really go in and let that actively doing nothing, let that nothing really infiltrate their being. Yeah, and I feel we, we can do a better job with, with, it, with our saunas and the ice baths that we really point out to people the, the relaxation afterwards, the, the stillness afterwards is actually amplifying the benefit and is maybe the main benefit of, of going into these extreme, you know, environments with your body. So that's uh, such, such a powerful message. It is. And so even having, I don't know, you could sell little hammocks or little beds or mm. you know, what, it's just to really just, you know, give that message that the sauna is the session, that the benefit is anchored. I mean, the sauna is really beneficial, don't get me wrong. You know. We anchor those benefits at the end, when you, when you relax and come back to yourself, you come mm -hmm. back to your and, and that's really powerful. And the whole time, the other thing that I, you know, I'm super passionate about, we could talk for hours on is you need to stay hydrated with good water. Yes. Cause if you get dehydrated, then you can't come back into yourself because yourself is mostly water, 99.9% water molecules because water is so small compared to the other big molecules, you know, two thirds by volume or by mass, but if you count your molecules, you're mostly water. And when you're especially saunary or ice bathing, you want to make sure you're really well hydrated because otherwise you can't really come back into a, a balanced position. Right. So you're saying like the, the body is not functioning well unless you're completely hydrated and, and that, that's how, how its optimal stage basically requires to have optimum hydration yeah. level. Yeah. Well, it is, but it's like, like the, so dehydration is a stress. Mm -hmm. And it's not bad to be dehydrated. Mm. So you feel that stress, mm. but then when you're really dehydrated, when you have a good, like good water, it's like, it's such a joy. You know, that, that first drink of water when you're super thirsty, uh -huh. most people never get that thirsty anymore. You know, we have drinks and coffees and teas and they get, they get dehydrated because they often tea and coffee are di diuretics. And if you're in a sauna and you haven't drunk and you get dehydrated, having that, that drink is like, oh, it's, it's. It's an incredible experience. So yeah, you really appreciate good water. So it's not bad to be a dehydrated, but to come back into balance and to be like actively relaxed, you can't do that when you're dehydrated. You need to be hydrated well for your body just to, to let go and relax. Just being a bit cheeky here, because I know you, you know, 
your water. Can you talk a little bit about your products that you actually sell for, for filter water? The reason why, why I actually throw this in here is because I've been using your filters for some years now. And, well, you know, visitors have the option between spring water, or I used to have the option because I don't do that anymore, spring water coming from certain places and just filtered town water in Byron, you know, whatever. That's not bad water with your filters. And people normally choose your filtered water, which is it's a bit strange, but, you know, you might have an explanation for that. So, it, and, and, you know, at the end of the show, I think we really should, should talk about where, where people can find your products as well. But so, I've just, got a whole weight of products now. So I, so I set up a, you know, I'm a medical doctor. That was my main profession and an academic. And I used to have patients coming to me and, and I used to tell them, you know, it's so important the water you drink because water, especially nowadays, it's full of pesticides and yep. pharmaceuticals and microplastics. And these chemicals are, are diabetogens and obesogens and carcinogens. And even the flavor, I mean, and then you have chlorine and fluoride and, and, and petrochemicals and mm. heavy metals and sediment. So there's all this crap in our water. Mm. And we're going to rehydrate and be healthy. We are mostly water. So ha having good water is the basis of good health. And mm. I'm a big fan of Bill Mollison from Permaculture. He created that. He said that you know, when you get the basic things right, everything else goes right by itself. But if you get the basic things wrong, it's really hard to play catch up. Yeah. So if you get, if you've got good water, then your body can metabolize, do, do what it needs. If you've got bad water and you're full of microplastics and the diabetogens and obesogens, then you try and lose weight because you know, you're getting fat, but you're still drinking bad water. It's, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to catch up. So I created a water company called Beautiful Water. And I looked at, looked at and I mean, I, I didn't want to, I, I wanted to find the best water children to say, Hey, buy that. That's the best water filter. But I couldn't. So I created a water company called Beautiful Water. And one of the requirements was that I wanted water that I could bathe in. Because there was some really solid research that says that if you drink chlorinated water, you get these chloroform and trihalomethanes and, and stuff that, that get broke, disinfection byproducts get broken down. But if when you drink it, it actually, they don't go into your blood because your filter, your liver filters it out. So the water goes into your you know, digestion and it goes through your liver and that'll filter out all these digestion disinfection byproduct. That's okay for your blood, but it's not good for your liver. So fatty liver is a big issue and, and you know, it's a hit on your liver. But the research they did, they showed if, if you're in a hot bath or a shower, and even if the water's not touching your skin, and they put people in a special wet suit, and they just got them to breathe the, the bath water, they found that, that the chlorine, the disinfection byproducts, went straight into their lungs, bypassed the liver, and went straight into their blood. Wow. And it was the same if they touched the water but breathed fresh air, just by touching the water with chlorinated, it goes straight into your skin, straight into your blood, bypasses the liver. So I wanted a, a filter that would be good enough to bathe in. Yes. So it had to have a good flow rate. And so I, I created this filter brand, beautiful water. And then the other thing that I couldn't find and I had to create was a water filter that had intention in the design that made you feel good about it. And, and I spent a lot of time with indigenous elders from all around the world, actually, and, and I, I became very close with Grandma Agnes Baker Pilgrim, who's passed now, but she was the chairperson of the Indigenous, the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. So all these Indigenous grandmothers, so she was a, made this council, and she was all about talking about water. And what all these Indigenous elders told me is you have to, feel, you have to treat your water sources sacred. You want to have a good feeling to your water. You want to give thanks to water. You want to have you know, a positive intention around your water. And most people, they get their water from an industrial meter, the council, you know, the government's put chemicals in it, the, the lines are a hundred years old, they've got chemicals in it. There's nothing to feel good about. Mm. So why should we, we spent a lot of time over a year working with designers to build, to create a design that had sacred geometry and special symbols in it, but also has subliminal blessing. So in, inside Metatron's cube, which is this sacred geometry, which has all the platonic solids, there are these little lines and these lines in my design say, I love you. I respect you. I thank you. I bless you. I am you over and over and over again. Now you can't actually read them, but the printer, I mean, they tell me they, these are such a hassle to print because <laughs> the files are so huge, Yeah, but the information's there. So there's like, and the, and the filters look beautiful. I mean, they, they've got colors, they've got some incredible sacred geometry on them. So there's intention in, in that. So that was something I wanted to include in, in my own brand. So that's beautiful water has that. So it has you know, the intention, the consciousness, it also has 
the technology, and it's actually a Russian technology. I don't know how we're allowed to talk about Russian stuff now, but, but I mean, Russians, they have the most amazing filter technology, which uses activated carbon, uses eco-polymers, iron exchange resin, where it removes pretty much all the contaminants as they flow through, but at a rate where you can actually shower in it. Yes. So, so I created that and, and I love to sauna and I love to drink good water. So I did this for myself and now you know, I have a company that does that. And for a while, I was like all about the water. And yep. then, then I became in, enamored with, you know, herbs and, and fermentation. Mm. What we found of Tulsi in the Holy Basil. And I, I wrote these textbooks that naturopaths have studied for the last 20 years. Mm. Like they, they're in four, you know, fourth edition now. So I was a big fan of Tulsi, Holy Basil. And then I had a friend who has a kombucha company. We made leaf products up here in the, in the bottle there, which is kombucha vinegar. And we were talking about how, you know, you get amplify the polyphenols when you, and, and we start with really good water <laughs> and we vortex and putting tension in the water. Then we get the organic tea and, and biodynamic sugar. And we ferment that into kombucha. So for a while I've been, to, and then we add leaves, roots, flowers, fruits, and fungi. Because I wrote the textbook on herbs and supplements, you know, we were able to select really good herbs based on their properties. We have one for your gut, one for your brain, one for your hormones, one for detox, one for the immune system, one for blocking spike protein. So we have these amazing kombucha vinegars, but they're vinegar, they're sour. You know, you can't just drink them. They're not, I mean, they're, they're great to put in water. They're amazing for hydration. So if you put just a, a shot of, it's like apple cider vinegar, but better in your water after the sort or during the sort, it, it becomes really thirst quenching. But now what I've just discovered is you put the vinegar with honey. You mix mm. that together. And if it's good honey, it takes a while to dissolve. But once it's dissolved, it stays dissolved. And then it's not sour or sweet. It's delicious. So the yeah. sweetness of the honey and the sourness of the vinegar sort of balance each other. Mm -hmm. And that's when you get the oximal. And this is what Hippocrates used to prescribe. And what I do is I use the oxymoron. You can, you can have it like a little shop. It's like a dessert wine or something like that. You only need a little, you know, tablespoon of it. It's quite potent. Mm -hmm. or, or you can put it like a cordial and mix it with in soda water or, or still water. And it's like a concentrated soft drink, but it's super healthy. Like you get, it's, so, it's a soft drink you give to your kids and encourage them to drink it. And, and they'll love it because it's got the sweetness of the honey, the sourness of the vinegar, and then the herbs that you can put into, to give it some other flavors and, and you know, other sort of different flavor notes. So, and often it's nice to have a bit of a bitter because so the sour, sweet, and bitter goes really well together. So yeah, for now become, you know, the, the honey, for, but to have honey and to have kombucha vinegar, you need good water and you need, we call it stacking, you know, you stack different benefits on top of each other. So good water and then hot and cold mm. and rehydration and with honey and vinegar. And, and suddenly you become really vibrant and, and, and it becomes easier and more delicious and, and they're just more fun the more things you, you include. Yeah. So good. So good. One thing that comes to mind about your filters as well, and, and, you know, I have them in my houses. So what, what I really enjoy also is that it mimics basically the, the, the river coming down, coming down in, in, in mountain. And I thought, I mean, we, we can, it's a whole, I mean, we can talk for hours on this. We probably have in the past. So yeah, the other thing about these filters is they structure the water. Yeah. And, and you know, I learned about this in 2016, I went to, and I actually spoke at the international conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, which is what Gerald Pollack, he runs that every year. That was in Bulgaria in, in 2016. And um, Gerald Pollack has this great video on, on the fourth phase of water. And he talks about structured water and how water doesn't just have three phases of solid, liquid, and gas. It's got a fourth phase, which is a gel phase. Yes. Which is, which is the water that's in our cells. Cause you know, if you think about where 99.9% .9 water molecules, cause water is so small compared to our other molecules, but then why are we a puddle on the ground? And that's because the water in our bodies is in a gel phase and that's structured water and, and water gets structured by UV light. It gets structured by forming vortexes. And like when a water flows down a natural stream, it doesn't flow straight. It actually mm -hmm. whirls and um, cavitates and you have turbulence. And structured water, which the, these filters through the eco polymer, the water has to go through, it actually dissolves calcium crystals. So it, it, you don't get scale build up on your pipes and stuff. It means if you're making bread, the bread's moister. If, if you're making concrete, the concrete's stronger. If you're giving it to your plants, they grow faster because they can, they can take in the water better. If you're using detergent, you need less soap to make it clean. And in fact, the water itself will clean by itself with 
because you, you don't get the, the, the hard water often doesn't soap up, but this is crazy softened because you've dissolved the calcium minerals in the structured water. So it means you can clean things better and you don't get a, um, a buildup on your shower screen of minerals on your shower. I don't know if you've noticed that at home since that means light filter. And the research is pretty conclusive. If you talk to bakeries that have started to use these types of devices and the technology that you have in your filters, they need less water in, in their actually bread and, and you know, whatever yeah, they produce. Awesome. The bread actually tastes better. Yeah. Unreal. So how does the body does, do that? How, how does the body create then this gem? Yeah. We, we can actually takes, it takes work. I mean, the body, first of all, our body makes its own water. There is literally a well in your being. And, and it's sort of biology 101. If you think about the, the, the respiration, you know, when you take a glucose molecule and you, t and you glucose molecule plus oxygen molecule gives you energy. Mm. So, you know, you burn glucose with oxygen, you get six molecules of carbon dioxide, you get energy for muscle contraction or whatever, and you want to get six molecules of water. Mm -hmm. So for every glucose molecule you, you metabolize, you actually make six molecules of water. So wow. that, that's mitochondrial water that, that is actually metabolic water, which is structured. And you only make about a glass a day. Yeah. Um, but then water gets structured alongside membranes. Whenever water is next to a membrane, that membrane creates a zone. They call it the exclusion zone. Where water is next to that, that zone, it becomes structured. Mm. And if mm. you think about mitochondria, there's masses of membranes, or that they call it the Christi in the, in the mitochondria, layers and layers of membrane. So the way our body does it is by having lots and lots of membranes where the water goes up against. And that, that helps to structure the water. And if you have unstructured water, your body can't absorb it as easily. Wow. And, and, and they actually, you can actually see molecularly that a structured water looks like sheets of these hexagonal cells. So it forms in layers and they call it exclusion zone water is because it excludes solutes. So salts and other things. So that, that water next to the membrane is more pure. It doesn't have as much dissolved substances in it. And that's where I was saying about the calcium crystals that it, it restructures them. And that, that's because with the calcium, it's, it's to do with calcite versus aragonite. So calcite's a, a, like a brick shape, a rectangle molecule, and that can form scale, it can build on itself. Whereas aragonite's a calcium carbonate crystal that's more diamond shape. And diamond shapes won't build on themselves, they'll sort of slide over each other. So you haven't got rid of the minerals, the minerals are still there, but they don't form scale. And that's great for your pipes, but it's also great for your body. Your body can use it much better. Incredible. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, I mean, you're drinking it every day. You've got, you've got the filter at home. So, yeah. Really cool. Mark, thank you so much for this, this good overview of, well, some of the research you're involved. I know you. I would be a bit scattered. I mean, I'm, what you told with me, there are so many things I get so excited about. Whether it's honey and ferments and water right. and saunas and ice bathing. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I think it fits all, all into each other as well. You know, it's, it all makes up, up, I think an incredible lifestyle as well. And if you follow these well, products. That, that's, that's what I, I'm really passionate about. How do we create a culture of wellness that is part, it's part of our life. It's not something we have to do, you know, when we get sick or, or, you know, have to think about it's something that's built into our lives. And, you know, I, I, I love educating people about that and changing their life and you know, while I'll sell water filters or I'll sell kombucha, I encourage people to make their own kombucha. Mm. And all my patients, I say, you know, our ancestors would have ferments every day with every mm. meal, every cuisine. Most cuisines do that. They have a bit of kimchi or sauerkraut or pickles or some bit of a little bit of yogurt or something that's alive with every meal. We've stopped doing that. So do it yourself with, you know, hot and cold bathing. I mean, you can spend 10 grand on a, on a ice bath and 30 grand on a sauna. We just have mm. a hot and cold shower. Mm. I encourage all of it, you know. Yes. Even cold showers are great. And, you know, I love turning things into poetry. So I've, I've been writing poems about different activities you can do and, and yeah, you know, the cold water hokey pokey, a little dance you can do in the shower. So I've got, you know, my website, I've got these, you know, wellness poems that really summarize information in a form of poetry that, that sort of gives a summary message of what I'm talking about. Incredible. I've got, you know, lots of different poems, but um, probably my favorite one to talk about on podcast and it's short, but it's, I'm sort of proud of it. It's a, a poem I created in the start of the pandemic where I was thinking about all the things you can do at home mm -hmm. that don't require any cost training or equipment. And they've got research evidence that they improve immunity and reduce anxiety. Mm. So I'm starting to this list of all the different things. And, you know, I've been a professor of natural medicine for a long time. And so, you know, I had a good list going. And then I started writing this list and it turned into a, a poem. So I call this poem, The World of Wellness. 
And it's how to go from wired and tired to chilled and fulfilled, or how to go from stressed and depressed to joyfully blessed. Mm. And it, so things you can do at home without cost training or equipment that will improve your health. So the world of wellness, hold someone's hand, gaze into their eyes, go barefoot in nature, bask in sunrise, choose a dance partner and go find your groove, do Tai Chi or yoga and mindfully move, share a massage, enjoy healing touch, focus on one thing and don't think too much, make time for a hobby, play chess, fly a kite. Make use of your hands, draw, paint, sew, or write. Help someone in need. Donate to a cause. Play games. Meditate. Read stuff from bookstores. Turn off your screens and get a good sleep. Declutter. Bark joy and love what you keep. Dig around in a garden. Pick up a guitar. Flip into a bathtub, sauna, or spa. Care for a pet, take up a sport, go on vacation and make your home a resort. Lie in a hammock, relieve pent up stress, relax and do nothing, and then do even less. Laugh out loud, share a joke, give someone a kiss, say a prayer, chant a mantra, and offer and, and follow your bliss. Love it. Yeah, it's sort of fun. It's fun to your It's just a good reminder that people are after these high-tech solutions for their health, but sometimes these really low-tech solutions, if you make them part of your life, you have this life of joy. And if you go into my website, each of those, that poem is there, but there's a link to all the research behind each of those activities. There's 50 activities in that poem. They all have research behind it. So people can, it's like a systematic review, you know, literature review in a poem. Gee, you're just not a normal human, eh? <laughs> I have a lot of fun with this information. I mean, I've been yeah, fun. Been fun. a long time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. So what would be the website that is best to start? Uh, during, Dr. During... Mark, D-R-M-A-R-C dot yeah. C-O. That's it. Oh, great. And we will okay. find your filters, your your unit. Um, you'll find the filters, the kombuchas, the poems. You'll find a link to, I don't know if I, I don't, so I don't gather by Manuka with the Honey Company. I don't know if I've got that on my website. Mm. Probably got to, in my bio that I'm, I'm a director at, you know, of product development gathered by for the honey, but yeah, I'll, most of my stuff's there. I don't update it that often and I'm not super active on socials, but, but I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook. People can find me there. I've got a personal and a professional page on Facebook, which I try and update stuff. Love it. Mark, thank you so much for being part of this again. I really appreciate all the, all the different insights that you offered and, and the way that you explained it as well. I felt, felt it really, really relatable and, and actually digestible as well. So thanks, thanks so much for being here. We hope you got a lot out of today's inspiring conversation. Please share this episode with someone you know needs to hear it. Whether they are a seasoned health expert or just beginning their wellness journey, these stories of remarkable transformation, success and valuable insights will certainly help empower more people. Until next time, have the best life ever.